The US and Iran are old enemies. Their enmity dates back to the Iranian Revolution of 1979, in which the US-backed Shah Mohammad Reza Pahlavi was overthrown and Ayatollah Ruhollah Khomeini became the supreme leader of Iran. Iran considers the US to be the great Satan, Shaitan e Buzorg, and the US establishment has long harbored a dream of invading Iran or at the least bombing Iran. Now, according to the Telegraph, the US Navy is preparing for war in the Persian Gulf region because apparently the, U the Iranians never learn. And this article appears at a time when unusual US military deployments are happening in a rather low key manner in the Persian Gulf region and other parts of the world as well. So this comes in the wake of major geopolitical developments in Europe, in Ukraine, in Africa, the anti-colonialism coup in Niger, and much more. So is the US planning to attack or invade Iran? Please subscribe and let's examine this matter. So in July this year, the Biden administration ordered 3,000 reserve troops to be ready for deployment, possibly in Europe, but possibly somewhere else also. It could be somewhere else as well. The same month, July this year, the US deployed 2,500 troops to the northern regions of Syria, which are currently under the control of the Kurdish PKK organization. And the US already has a substantial, significant military presence in the Middle East. It operates dozens of military bases and several air bases in this region. The US, if you look at the map, has military bases and troops in Saudi Arabia, in Iraq, in the UAE, in Bahrain, in Oman, in Syria, in Turkey, Jordan, Egypt, Kuwait, possibly Pakistan, possibly elsewhere as well. And the US has a significant and powerful naval presence in this region as well. And a lot more US military hardware is being moved to the Persian Gulf. Now, the US accuses Iran of routinely harassing commercial vessels in the Strait of Hormuz and the Persian Gulf region. So this could be the pretext it needs to attack Iran if it wants to. And if we look at past history, the US has taken military action against Iran on, multi on multiple occasions in the past. If you go back to 1988, a US warship, USS Vincennes, shot down Iran Air Flight 655 while it was flying over Iranian territorial waters in the Persian Gulf. And this ended up killing about 290 innocent civilians. More recently, in 2020, the U.S. assassinated the Iranian general Qasem Soleimani via a drone strike in Baghdad in Iraq. And, of course, Iran is involved in various proxy wars in the Middle East and Persian Gulf region. It's involved in proxy wars of some kind of the, or the other in Iraq, in Lebanon, in the Palestinian territories, Gaza, Israel, that region, in Syria, in Yemen, there's this Iran-Israel proxy war that's going on. So Iran is involved in all these various proxy wars as we speak. And the US and Israel are concerned about Iran's nuclear program, especially Israel. So to unpack all this, to understand the history as to why all of this is going on and what are, what are the causes of this, let's examine the history of this region and the history of Iran and the US-Iran relationship. And let's start around 1900. So in the early 1900s, the Qajar dynasty ruled Iran and it was weakened by that point by political and economic instability, which and the causes of that go back to the 19th century, which we will not go into for today. So that's what uh, was going on in the early 1900s. Now, in 1906, a constitutional revolution took place, which established Iran's first constitution and the parliament, the majlis. In, this, in, in the First World War, Iran remained neutral, but it suffered from occupation by British and Russian forces. In 1921, a soldier named Raza Khan staged a coup, and he became the de facto ruler of Persia. In 1925, he rebranded himself as Raja, Raza Shah Pahlavi, the founder of the Pahlavi dynasty. In 1935, Iran was officially named. Until then, it had been called Persia for the longest time ever. But now in 1935, it was rebranded and renamed as Iran. 
in 1941 british and soviet forces occupied iran during the second world war and they removed raza shah from power because of his access ties and they replaced him with his son mohammad raza shah who ended up ruling with western support so this uh, started uh, mohammad raza shah's rule started in 1941 in 1951 he appointed mohammad mosaddegh as prime minister and almost immediately prime minister mosaddegh nationalized iran's oil industry which led to a straightforward straight away crisis with britain so this move led to a standoff with britain and the anglo iranian oil company which was later rebranded as british petroleum now it's called bp so uh, this move led it it received widespread support from the iranian pub- population from the iranian public and mohammad mosaddegh was seen as a nationalist hero so naturally there had to be a coup which removed him from power so in 1953 there was a cia backed coup an american backed coup which ousted mohammad mosaddegh and restored the shah shah of iran's power so uh, this guy mohammad riza shah or mohammad riza pahlavi came back to power 1953 uh, in 1963 his uh, white revolution started modernization efforts but it faced opposition from traditionalists in the 1970s there was rapid economic growth in iran but also increased inequality political repression and increasing protests and uh, uh opposition to the rule of the shah and this began to escalate in 1978 when there were significant major massive protests which kept on escalating against the shah's rule and this is what we call the iranian revolution or the islamic revolution of iran so in january 1979 the shah of iran mohammad reza pahlavi was forced to flee from iran and this led to the return of ayatollah khomeini from exile he was in exile i believe in france and in april that year 79 iran became an islamic republic through a referendum in november that year 1979 iranian students seized seized the us embassy and they captured uh, the diplomats working there as hostages so they were held hostage for 444 days this was the the great crisis the iran uh, hostage crisis and obviously the us uh, imposed sanctions on iran uh, because of all this sanctions are a form of economic siege warfare so that's where it all began that's where the the enmity between iran and the us originates from roughly it, it dates back to before as well as we saw about uh, the cia overthrow of mohammad mosaddegh and so on but 1979 is essentially the beginning for all intents and purposes of the iran us hostilities and enmity in 1980 the iran iraq war began this was a proxy war between the us and iran iraq was the us proxy it was ruled by saddam hussein al tikriti and saddam hussein was a us proxy so the us armed iraq they gave them weapons and supplies and money and whatever the iraq iraq is needed whatever saddam hussein needed and saddam fought this war on the us on 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 the on the behalf of the us against iran so this war went on from 1980 to 1988 and this war was devastating it caused tremendous devastation economic devastation massive casualties on both sides and yes it was it was a terrible ruinous war in the light, in the late 1980s a ceasefire eventually ended the iran iraq war i think around 88 The next year, 1989, Ayatollah Khomeini died, and he was succeeded by Ali Khamenei as the supreme leader. 1997, if you fast forward, Mohammad Khatami became the president of Iran. He initiated some sort of limited political reforms. 2005, Mahmoud Ahmadi Najad became the president. He was accused of being one of the participants in the Iran hostage crisis, one of the one of the uh, hostage takers. So 2005 Ahmadi Najad became the president 2009 he was re-elected as president and there were protests against him 2013 Hassan Rouhani became the president of of the uh, of, of Iran he uh, promised greater engagement with the west and that uh, eventually culminated in the 2015 signing of the joint comprehensive plan of action the JCPOA nuclear deal between Iran and 
world powers, which powers the US, the UK, France, Germany, Russia, and China. So this happened in 2015. Sanctions were eased. Uh, you know, uh, the JCPOA was implemented. But in 2018, the US under uh, President Trump unilaterally withdrew from the JCPOA and reimposed the sanctions on Iran. So this uh, ended up, uh, you know, taking away all of the United States' uh, leverage from Iran. So this was in 2018. Uh, between 2019 and 2020, there were, there were widespread protests in Iran over political freedom, economic issues, and so on. Uh, the Iranians alleged that these were orchestrated by external actors, external powers. It's a euphemism, a euphemism for the U.S., in 2020, a U.S. drone strike killed the Iranian general Qasem Soleimani, which uh, ratcheted, up the, ratcheted up the tensions in the region. In 2021, Ibrahim Raisi became the president. He is still the president as of today, 2023. So that is, in very brief, an overview of the history of, of the 20th century history of Iran and of the Iran-US relationship, which is very strained and hostile. The, U the Iranians call the US Shaitan e Buzorg, the, um, the great devil, great Satan. So let's analyze what's happening right now from the geopolitical perspective. Let's take a look at the geopolitical big picture. So if we look at the 20th century, the defining conflict of the 20th century was the US-USSR Cold War. The Cold War was the main defining conflict in the 20th century. Today, in the first quarter or first third of the 21st century, the defining conflict of our time is Cold War 2.0, which is the US-China uh, battle for supremacy. And the US obviously is on top. It's the existing superpower. It's the sole superpower. And China is the aspiring superpower. China has this great dream, the, the Chinese dream of, of replacing and displacing the US as the sole superpower by roughly 2050 or so. And the great rejuvenation of the Chinese nation and all that terminology which they use, the CCP, CPC, whatever you want to call it, they use that. And that's Xi Jinping's great dream, President Xi Jinping. So um, the defining uh, conflict of this time that we live in is the Second Cold War, the Cold War 2.0, the, the battle for supremacy between the US and China. And from the US perspective, the Chinese upstart must be dealt with. It is a major threat that cannot be allowed to become greater than what it already is. The U.S. will not allow any significant competitor to rise on the horizon. China, they've already made a big mistake by aiding and abetting and midwifing the rise of China. It's the U.S. that made this happen, the rise of China. And now they need to find a way to deal with China. So the U.S. wants to deal with China. China must be dealt with. The U.S. needs to chip away at the Chinese threat. The U.S. wants to gradually erode the Chinese threat without actually engaging in a hot kinetic conflict or war with China. So they have set the geopolitical chessboard. They have been setting, they have been placing, putting the pieces in motion, in place. And uh, we see all of that happening right now. In a, not quite in slow motion, it's happening rather rapidly. We know what's happening in, in Europe. Europe is in crisis. We have the Ukraine war that's going on over there. Europe has entered a recession. It's being starved of cheap energy, of affordable energy. So it's it's entered a recession. Uh, that's in Europe, but we are talking about Asia. So let's take a look at Asia. So east of Iran, Pakistan has been sorted. Pakistan, the Americans have sorted it after the ouster of Imran Khan. Imran Khan wanted to be neutral in the Ukraine conflict. Imran Khan wanted to be on China's side, but the US has ensured that Imran Khan was ousted. I have spoken about this in detail. And now Pakistan is firmly back on, on the US side of the aisle. The generals are the, the power that re really run Pakistan and they have been dealt with. So Pakistan is sorted. Um, and recently we heard the news that the Iran-Pakistan gas, gas pipeline, which some were calling the Nord Stream of Asia, well, this has been scrapped. The Pakistanis have scrapped this uh, project, obviously because of US pressure. They are saying that we cannot, we are not in no position to withstand US sanctions or any other 
action. So we need to scrap this project. So Pakistan is clearly sorted. What about Afghanistan, the other eastern neighbor of Iran? Well, in the case of Afghanistan, there appears to be a secret deal between the Taliban and the United States. So in 21, when the US handed over Afghanistan to the Taliban on a platter, there were rumors of a secret understanding between the Americans and the Taliban. Um, and India also uh, expressed concerns about this. And now, recently, uh, the former Afghan vice president, Mr. Amrullah Saleh, who, he was vice president until 2021, August 21, when Taliban took over. So very recently, Amrullah Saleh has, uh, Amrullah Saleh has tweeted that the Taliban are essentially a U.S. proxy. And he says that the U.S. are giving essentially uh, $60 million per week stipend to the Taliban, which makes the Taliban a U.S. proxy, a U.S. client, whatever you want to call it. right? So that's the claim that he has made, that the Taliban are essentially the United States Wagner force in Asia. If that is true, if what Mr. Amrullah Saleh is claiming is true, then then Afghanistan is also sorted. It's also on the U.S. side. We know that that Iraq is under U.S. control. It's been under U.S. control since 2000 and, uh, 2003. Turkey is a NATO member, so it's on the U.S. side. Oman is on the U.S. side. The UAE is on the U.S. side. Turkmenistan, which is east of the Caspian Sea, on the eastern shore of the Caspian Sea, well, Turkmenistan is in Russia's sphere of influence. It's in Russia's zone of what they call it's their exclusive influence. But Turkmenistan, one could, can say, is open to lean towards the US. It's looking for an opportunity, possibly. So that's what that's the deal with Turkmenistan. Azerbaijan is pro-Turkey. It's pro-US. Kuwait is pro-US. So if you look at the map of all this, you will see that the US has essentially encircled Iran. That's the deal. That's that's the situation right now. So the US needs to deal with China. China is a significant threat. China obviously is entering a period of demo demographic decline, which could become a demographic disaster. But for the next 20, 30 years, China is a major force, a force to be reckoned with. And they are bolstering up their military. They're beefing up the military muscle. They are churning out warships like sausages. The Chinese mean business. And the Chinese are a major threat right now. And so China needs to be dealt with. So the question is, why is Iran important vis-a-vis -vis China and also Russia? Right? That's the question. The, the other major threat for the US is Russia. So why is Iran important in this context? So we have to understand that China is expanding its influence in the Persian Gulf region. We know that the Chinese have this naval base in Djibouti, their only naval base in Africa. Then we have to look at the fact that in uh, around 2020, roughly around that time, the Chinese signed a $400 billion comprehensive strategic deal with Iran. It's a 25-year deal which covers lots of critical areas like security and economics and finances, infrastructure, petrochemical infrastructure and whatnot. It's a major comprehensive strategic deal with Iran that the Chinese have signed. And obviously, it's all about energy. It's all about oil. So it's a comprehensive deal. And as the years pass, it's a 25-year deal. So as the years and decades pass, the two economies of Iran and China will become more and more interdependent and interconnected. And this will make it difficult for such an agreement to expire. That is the big picture perspective on this 25-year a uh, 400 billion dollar strategic deal comprehensive strategic deal between the between the Iranians and the Chinese so this deal makes Iran an indispensable ally for China because Iran since its inception let's say in 79 has declared the US to be its arch enemy and Iran and China both oppose US global hegemony and dominance so that's why Iran is an indispensable ally for China and this agreement this uh, deal also includes stationing 5000 Chinese troops inside Iran we know that the uh, China Pakistan economic corridor also involved stationing Chinese soldiers 
on Pakistan territory and Pakistani controlled territory and especially galling for India is the fact that the Chinese soldiers were stationed in Pakistan, temporarily Pakistan occupied Jammu and Kashmir and Gilgit Baltistan. Right. So this Iran-China agreement involves stationing some 5,000 Chinese troops inside Iran. And then there's the, the fact that, that uh, we have the International North-South Transport Corridor, which connects India with Iran and Azerbaijan and Russia and Europe. And China also would like to be a, a part of that. And they will obviously um, uh, try and be a part of that. So all of these things are interconnected now let's also take it uh, take a look at the broader region the gulf region the persian gulf region we uh, recently in december 2022 president xi jinping visited saudi arabia and the the two nations signed the china saudi arabia comprehensive strategic partnership agreement so this agreement is another comprehensive major agreement which uh, covers lots and lots of different areas they signed 34 investment agreements as part of this deal and these agreements cover lots of very disparate sectors in various fields like green energy and green hydrogen and cloud services and information technology and housing and medical industries and transportation logistics think of anything and it's essentially more most likely covered but overall it's once again about energy it's about oil and gas mainly about oil the chinese are they they are they crave energy and they would like to take care of their long term energy needs their energy security requirements that's why they are very interested in iran and saudi arabia and they've you know uh, wrapped up these major deals with these nations and of course saudi arabia wants to be part of brics iran has also expressed uh, its desire to become part of brics uh, so all of that also has to be taken into perspective and then we have the saudi iran rapprochement which uh both nations have given credit to China for brokering this agreement. So this is an agreement that happened in April 2023. The, 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 the Saudis and the Iranians, they restored diplomatic relations after a break of seven years. So uh, in 2016, I believe, uh, the two nations had broken off diplomatic ties after the Saudi execution of a Shia sheikh called uh, Nimr al-Nimr. So that's in 2016, the two nations broke off diplomatic relations. And now they have given China the credit for them re-establishing diplomatic relations. So it's clear that the Chinese footprint in the Persian Gulf region is increasing. It's expanding. The Chinese are gaining influence in this region. The US is in a corresponding fashion losing influence in the Persian Gulf region. It's losing influence but not power. And the US have gone after the Saudis in the past few years. We have seen that. It all began with the Jamal Khashoggi affair in 2018. Um, the Americans have, have targeted Mohammed bin Salman, the, the crown prince of Saudi Arabia, and they have alienated, alienated him. And he has been making all these moves that are very dangerous from a personal perspective. It could, you know, I mean, you go against the US, you could pay a significant, very steep, price but that's what he is doing thus far successfully uh, so the saudis are still you could say a u.s proxy they they buy enormous amounts of u.s weapons every year they have a large number of u.s bases on their soil they have u.s soldiers on their territory so you could say that that just like to us to a certain extent like japan and like south korea the saudis also you can say are to some extent under, under U.S. military occupation. So the U.S. influence is declining, but the U.S. power is not declining in this region. So that brings us back to Iran. So Iran is the nation that's essentially encircled by the U.S. And the U.S. has always had this dream of invading Iran and teaching Iran a lesson and putting Iran in its place. And that's the deal. So if the U.S. were to invade Iran, this would also end its fears about Iran's nuclear program. So the Iranians have uh, have these ambitions of, of becoming a nuclear power. Nuclear, they would like to pro produce nuclear energy and they would also like to have nuclear weapons. So there is this threat that all the nations in this neighborhood perceive, they feel that Iran is a danger because Iran has this, this uh, this ambition of becoming a nuclear weapons power. The Israelis especially fear the Iranian nuclear program. So if the US were to invade Iran, it would end this fear, the specter 
of the possibility of Iran acquiring nuclear weapons. And of course, Iran is a major oil producer. It has enormous amounts of oil and gas reserves. So if the US were to invade Iran and conquer Iran, they would get a huge amount of free oil, which would help them replenish the US strategic petroleum reserve. So the US strategic petroleum reserve is an emergency stockpile of oil, petroleum, that's maintained by the US Department of Energy. And right now, this stockpile is at way below optimum levels. If you look at the latest figures, the, the petroleum reserve, the strategic petroleum, petroleum reserve currently holds 348 million barrels of oil, which is enough for less than three weeks of US oil consumption. So this is because the Biden administration, in an attempt to bring down or hold down oil and gasoline prices, sold 180 million barrels from this reserve last year for an average of about $96 per barrel. So this, because of this, the, the current levels are way below optimum levels. And this is something that could contribute to making invading Iran a very tempting prospect. The Iranian oil fields must be an irresistible temptation for the US, uh, especially after they've got a taste of this, after the successful occupation of Iran, of Iraq since 2003, and also Syria since 2011, especially after the Black Sea has been lost because of the entire situation in Ukraine. So if the US were to invade Iran, they would first need a justification, a pretext. And they have several ready-made, uh, you could say, justifications. One is they can always allege that the Iranians have been consistently harassing commercial vessels in the Persian Gulf region, in the Strait of Hormuz region, right? That's one excuse that's already there. They already have it. And then they could you know, raise the specter of the nuclear program, the Iran nuclear program. They could say that the, the uh, Iranians are violating whatever agreement or whatever conventions or whatever international law or make something up, right? They're making a nuclear bomb. How about that? That's that's scary enough for everybody. So uh, it's it's the good old WMD uh, scenario, weapons of mass destruction, which they never found in, in Iraq. Well, so, so if they really want to invade Iran, they could make up <clears throat> or, or claim that the Iranians are about to, uh, you know, acquire nuclear weapons. And the fact is that many Americans, especially older Americans, see Iran as an old enemy, an intractable enemy. And of course, foreign policy, military policy, all of that is an extension of domestic politics, no matter where you are in the world, especially in the, in the US. Now, and this brings us to US domestic politics, obviously. So Joe Biden, President Biden, when he first took office in January 21, he had an approval rating of 57%, which is good. But in recent months, multiple polls have shown that Biden's rate, rating, approval rating is hovering around the, lay, around the high 30s and low 40s, 35 to 39%, maybe 40, 41% approval. So as of right now, his approval rating, is, I think it's 40%. And disapproval rating is 54%. So the Biden administration is not doing great. I don't think the US public has a great deal of trust in in an extremely elderly person like Joe Biden and his rather incompetent vice president uh, Kamala Harris right so the Biden administration is not doing well it's not doing great the public is not uh, showing a great deal of trust in this administration so the democrats need they desperately need a win after the major setbacks in afghanistan and ukraine and a military victory over iran could be a major tremendous pre-2024 boost for them for their prospects in the 2024 u.s presidential elections so that is the deal so the question is will david axe's prediction of an upcoming u.s war with iran turn out to be true we will keep a close watch, a close eye on the situation. Thank you for watching and I will see you in the next video.